old, I think, as the Society of St. Pius X itself. Um, I'm going by the notes that Father Kimball gave me. But, um, so yes, so he's 52. Uh, ordained to the priesthood by Bishop Fellay in 1996. He was assigned to Rimini in Italy and to Singapore after that. Uh, and he returned to Italy as superior. And in 2012 to 2018, he was rector of the Seminary of Our Lady uh, Corredemptrix in La Reina in Argentina. In July 2018, he was elected to, he was elected the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X for his 12 year term. And I know that he was supposed to come to see us in 2020, but historical events intervened. And um, so after a two year wait, uh, we're delighted to welcome you, Father, to Ireland. Good morning. I'm delighted also to be here today. And we say, in particular, to be here to talk about uh, Holy Mass. It is uh, what we, is, we have the most uh, dear in the society, but actually Holy Mass is uh, what every Catholic needs to keep as the most dear pearl, uh, treasure in his life. And you know better than I do uh, how in the history of the church, uh, our ancestors, your ancestors, they had to suffer for Holy Mass, to keep Holy Mass. Why? There is a reason behind. And uh, this reason, I would say, is because of the influence that Holy Mass has on the society. This is a uh, theme of my talk. How and why Holy Mass is meant to transform the society. So you understand very well that if Mass is going to transform the society, uh, if uh, the rulers are not Catholics, they cannot love Mass. But before uh, we start with uh, this, uh, de developing this topic. I would like to start with the quotation of Pope Francis. It's a very fresh quotation of the 1st of September, 22. He was addressing himself to a group of uh, teachers of liturgy in Italy. So we will see what does it mean liturgy and tradition for Pope Francis. Progress is understanding and also in liturgical celebration most, must always be no, rooted in tradition. Oh, till here we, are, we agree which always takes you forward in that, in that sense that the Lord wants. There is a spirit that is not that of true tradition, ourself. The worldly spirit of backwardness, fashionable today, they are worried. Thinking that going to the roots means going backwards. That's not what we say. No, they are different, they are different things. If you go to the roots, the roots take you up, always, like the tree, which grows from what comes to it from the roots. And tradition is precisely going to the roots because it is the guarantee of the future. As Mahler said, instead, backwardness means taking two steps back because it is always has been done, done this way. 
It is a temptation in the life of the church that leads you to a worldly restorationism, disguised as liturgy and theology, but it is worldly. And backwardness always is worldliness. That is why the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, we are, we are not among those who shrink back. No, you go forward according to the line that the tradition gives you. To go backwards, it is to go against the truth and ask and also against the spirit. Make this distinction clearly, because in liturgy there are many who say they go according to tradition, but it is not the case. At most, they will be traditionalist. This is our case. Uh, what uh, does it mean to us? Tradition, and in particular, traditional mass. Because, uh, as Father said, traditional mass is, uh, does summarize our faith, our spiritual life, all we need to do, all we need to believe to, is there in, in, in that right. And why? So let's try to penetrate a little bit this uh, value of Holy Mass. What's Holy Mass? Holy Mass is the testament of our Lord. Our Lord didn't write anything during his life. He preached only. And all that he preached, he wanted to be summarized, codified in a way, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. During his life, let's try, let's try to penetrate a little bit the, the soul of our Lord during his life, while he was spreading the gospel, preaching the gospel. He had only one idea. He had only one aim in his life. It was to reach the passion, his hour. Everything was focused on that point, that moment. And the Last Supper, the first mass of the history, is an essential part of the passion of our Lord. And this idea of our Lord was clear. To perpetuate redemption, to perpetuate the mystery of the cross till the end of time. And what our Lord did in the Last Supper was already perfect. He gave to the Church Holy Mass and that Holy Mass was already perfect since the very beginning. We don't need to search for a new, a new theology of Holy Mass, a new understanding of Holy Mass. No. The Church got the right, the perfect understanding of Holy Mass since the very beginning. And for this reason, since Holy Mass is the way our Lord chose to perpetuate redemption. But Holy Mass is meant to transform souls. And transforming souls, Holy Mass will transform the society. Because when you transform souls, you will transform the relationship among them. And so you will transform the society. But, before we in, go into the different details of this transformation, what is the root 
of all transformations of souls. In this perspective that our Lord had during, uh, already during his life, and in particular in the institution of Holy Eucharist. It's very simple. Through his passion, through Holy Eucharist, our Lord gives himself out of love. The essence of redemption is the gift of himself for our soul, for our sanctification, for our sins. But since that is done out of love, wherever there is love, wherever there is friendship, loves out of reciprocity, reciprocity, calls back love on our side. All the spiritual life of the church is contained in this idea. This is the charity. We, we here are often, always, especially nowadays, nowadays uh, talking about love. But what's love for us? What's love for a Catholic? It's this one, and only this one. Love is our response, our reciprocity, reciprocity to the love of our Lord. This is friendship. So in the expression, uh, in the common expression, people, they love uh, dogs, they love uh, horses. Queen Elizabeth, she loved horses and dogs. But uh, it's a way of uh, speaking, uh, a common way, but there is not love between a human and, and a dog, strictly speaking. Why? Because there is not, they don't have in common eh, what our Lord wants to share with us, or the equivalent. There is not friendship, strictly speaking, with the dog, or with wine, or with the horse. So, everything is related to the gift of self, the spirituality of the Church, especially at the very beginning, when still in the Church, we didn't, they didn't have all the books, all the instruments, the tools that we have nowadays. Everything was contained in this idea, which is very clear, was, was very clear to everybody. Spiritual life is, means the gift of self out of charity. It is extremely simple. To go back to the roots, it means that. And this idea of the gift of self, this, this central idea provoked martyrdom, self-denial, religious life, fidelity through any kind of persecutions, out of love, out of this love calling always to the gift of self. But more in particular, how Holy Mass and by consequent Holy Eucharist, because Holy, we cannot separate Holy Mass and Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is the fruit of the Mass, is the fruit of the passion of our Lord. How Holy Eucharist, following this idea, does transform our souls and by consequent society. First of all, a Eucharistic soul will love in a new way. First of all, her heart will be transformed. That soul will love 
in the way our Lord loves, in the way God loves. That soul will love his brothers as they are, will accept them as they are, with the purpose to share with them the same treasure she has. Faith, eternity, sacraments. It is not true that if we love our neighbor, we, we start a dialogue without the purpose to convert them, to, be, to bring them to the truth, to the faith, and to share with them our treasures. No, it is not true. But this love is full of patience. And I would add also, such a heart transformed by Holy Eucharist will expand itself. And this uh, openness is the foundation of true unity among all the Christians, among all the Catholics. And you see here, because of, of this dilatation of the heart, of the soul, which is going to transform always also the human relationships, you, you get here the root of the social transformation uh, worked by Holy Mass and Holy Eucharist. It's not just a, um, a question of transformation of souls, individuals, without repercussions on the social side. The Eucharistic soul will believe in a different way. His faith is renewed each time that she receives communion. But not only his faith in the supernatural uh, truth, dogma, also his faith will be projected on all the events of this life. This is extremely important for us because we all, we are under the danger to evaluate the crisis of the church and by consequence the solution to the crisis of the church by human means, human ideas. So, we should tell the Pope what he should do, we should make a pressure on that bishop, we should push that priest, we should, we should, we should, we should, we should nothing. We have to, we have first to believe that the church is in the hands of God and as well is still providing to us, in spite of this disaster, is still providing to us all the means we need to sanctify our souls. He can, all on a sudden, whenever he wants, in the way he wants, he can restore his church. And if now he's uh, letting his church in this crisis, it is because when he will restore his church, it will be more evident to anyone that he is running his church through supernatural means. But to understand this, which is extremely important, otherwise we fall into discouragement. To understand this, we need to foster our faith. And we foster our faith, first of all, through Holy Communion. We renew our faith 
each time that we attend Mass. The Eucharistic soul, we can say, is already, in a way, resurrected, as we will be for good in the eternity. What does it mean? A Eucharistic soul doesn't fear anymore death, doesn't fear anymore this world. Because Holy Eucharist is the pledge of eternal life. Eternal life is nothing else but a perfect union between us and our Lord. Eternal life, paradise, is the life of our Lord communicated perfectly to our souls. He will share perfectly, fully, his life with us. And you understand, uh, in this perspective, that Holy Eucharist is the beginning of this life. And the more we enter into this perspective, the less we fear the world, the less we fear to lose anything in this world, the less we fear death. The more this life is starting now, the more we, we lose this uh, fear of the world itself. Another point to show always this transformation of the Eucharistic soul I would say a Eucharistic soul is able to celebrate. A Eucharistic soul is able to, if you give the expression, to make a feast, to, to enjoy. Why? It is a consequence of what we just said. Eternity, eternity is a feast. Eternity is, is a banquet. Eternity, in the terms eh, we, we used, eh, we explained, eternity is this long feast uh, in union with our Lord. A Eucharistic soul already is starting now this feast. I don't say feast day because it's, a, it's an eternal <laughs> feast. And of course, when we are able to enjoy already this eternal feast, of course, even the social, the social uh, uh, links, uh, relationship, are changed, are transformed. To understand better this point, look for a moment at a worldly man. A worldly man can enjoy also life, but it doesn't celebrate anything. He cannot celebrate. His joy, his worldly joy, is just for a moment is uh, related to a particular situation. It doesn't celebrate anything because there is no hope. His joy is that just a joy for a moment without relation to an eternal joy. And that's why the joy of this world is so weak, so temporary. The Eucharistic soul is uh, instructed also. Of what? What uh, Holy Eucharist? We said at the beginning that the uh, Holy Eucharist uh, and Holy Mass, they are the testament of our Lord. 
What does he say through this uh, special testament? Only one thing, his desire to stay with us. His desire to stay with us, to enter into our souls in order to transform them from inside. You see here the difference. You can change uh, people, you can change minds through norms, laws, and we need laws, of course. But when you change people and mind only through laws, that will be done only outwardly, in an exterior way. For our Lord is the opposite. He wants to transform souls from inside. He wants to transform, first of all, the will, the hearts and transforming the hearts and the wills, he will transform the behavior, the external behavior. And uh, he, he's reminding us at every communion this desire that he wants to stay with us. And you see, going back to this idea of the testament of our Lord, he reminds also another element. As well as his testament, any testament, he is uh, valid after the death of, of the one who made it, the testament. is the same for, for our Lord. His testament is valid not only after his death, but because it is his death. And we also, we can receive the benefit of his testament if, in our way also, we are transformed, dying to the world. We could go on, we could carry on with the other ideas the Eucharistic soul is healed, is pacified, is shining through. Every, I would say, every side of the soul, every side of the behavior of the soul is changed, transformed through Holy Eucharist. But, uh, I think it is important for us to retain the main idea. If we stick to tradition, if we stick to Holy Mass, it is because of all this. It is because we need this means that our Lord chose first for us. We cannot change it, and we cannot change uh, its, its, uh, uh, its meaning. We cannot change its understanding. There is not another way to reach our Lord, but the way He chose for us. And behind the, the new Mass, there is a new conception of liturgy, a new conception of worship. There is a new conception of our Lord also. There is a new conception of charity. That's why I stress at this point. There is a new conception of the gift of self. And since there is the, a new conception, which is not Catholic, the church is collapsing. The church is collapsing. The cause is there. The, it's not the fault of traditionalist people. The problem is there. Our churches are, our churches, I mean, the, in, uh, all over the world, are empty. 
The cathedrals are empty. And the few who still go to church, which is a miracle, what do they know? What do they learn? How can they persevere? How can they pass on their faith to their children? It's a disaster. What is the root of the disaster? It's here. You see that the liturgical issue, the liturgical problem, is not a question just of right. It's not just a question of vestments, of colors, of incense, of details, of laces. It's a question of faith. And moreover, it's a question of charity. How can we stick to our Lord? How can we love our Lord? How can we, how can we show our Lord our, our determination to give up everything for Him? Through a liturgy which is celebrating man, is celebrating something else. He's celebrating also faith, but in a completely new perspective. So, can we give up uh, the Tridentine Mass? Can we do that? Well, you know the answer. Huh? But it's not just a question of right. It's a question, it's a question again, of faith. And moreover, it is a question of love, of charity. It's because we love our Lord that we, want, we don't want to offer Him anything which is not worthy of Him. That's why we stick to tradition. We stick to this Mass, to Tridentine Mass. And that's why we cannot renounce to this Mass because we cannot renounce to our Lord. And we prefer martyrdom before, before this choice. Thank you very much for your attention.